Hello, everyone. This is the 55th episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I'm joined by Paul from Shipley in England. For this episode, we interview former English professional footballer, Mr. Rick Holden. Mr. Holden's playing career started in the 80s and into the 90s for the likes of Watford, Manchester City, Blackpool, and most prominently for Oldham Athletic in two separate spells. Mr. Holden's autobiography, Football, It's a Migging Life, came out in 2010. Um, good evening. Thanks for having me on. Our pleasure. Rick Holden was a player with an individual style and an unusual career, as we will discuss. I had the pleasure of watching Rick on the wing at Boundary Park during the most successful period of Oldham Athletic's modern history. He later provided an in-depth interview for my book before the Premier League, which he helped to publish through his Wibble Publishing Company. Rick, let me join Sean in thanking you for joining us and welcoming you to the podcast. No, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Uh, before we go back to your playing career and talk about some of the changes since then in English football, could you start mm -hmm. off by telling us about what you've been up to since you hung up your boots? Well, I, I um, immediately I finished playing. I went to work in the... Uh, the Yorkshire Clinic, which you'll be aware of that's in Cottingley, in Bingley, doing rehab work with Bradford Northern, as they were called then, rugby league team. And then uh, I got a chance to move to a, a job on the Isle of Man in the hospital there and took the family over. And then I got into sort of civilian life, if you like, and involved in amateur coaching. I played for a team called Peel on the Isle of Man for 10 years in total, but crammed most of the games into the first year uh, and coached. And then I helped the Isle of Man side. And then Andy Ritchie invited me to be Barnsley's physio in 2004 because the, their physio freaked and ran back to Iceland. So I worked in, at Barnsley Football Club for three years. And I came back to the Isle of Man and I've just been working my own practice since then and helping coaching a bit and stuff and, and writing books, as, as you well know, and general thingness, I would say. Thank you, Mr. Holden. Your career path is somewhat different than most players. As mm -hmm. you attended and completed college, the Carnegie College in Leeds, in fact, you turned down Burnley to earn your degree prior to signing as a professional with Halifax Town. Can you talk about this? Well, it's quite a simple thing. I, I know I was playing all sorts of sports at school and then graduated, as you lot say, over the pond to college. And playing for the college side, um, we used to play professional teams on a, on a Wednesday night when they didn't have a game. We had a really good college side. And back in those days, there were a good, good college setups, a bit like the US. And I just got picked up by Burnley and they said, come and trial and play for us. So I played in the reserves for six months, then played a first team game. And then the following season, I was about to start my second year in the degree and the manager had gone at Burnley. A new manager came in and said, look, you either sign full time or exit stage left. So I said, look, I'm not giving up my degree. I've got, you know, um, this is my long-term livelihood. So, because I didn't know whether I was going to make it as a footballer anyway. I mean, Burnley was fourth division. So I left and then I was playing cricket during the summer and I got a, a telephone call from Halifax Town, from a great chap called Billy Air, and said, look, you can come and train with us and play with us and you can continue your degree which was just the ideal world, you know, and that's how I got into football through that back door, if you like, but um, seemed to me quite a logical way of doing things. Now, after you'd made your name at Halifax, you entered the top flight with Watford in 1988 in what was the post Graham Taylor era. Yeah. Can you describe that experience? I mean, was it Steve Harrison yeah. that signed you for Watford? Yeah, I mean, that, 
this was brilliant, this. On one Saturday, I'm playing for Halifax Town against Scunthorpe United in front of 3,000 people at the old showground in Scunthorpe. Monday morning, I go into training and Billy Air, the manager, said, look, Watford have been on the phone. You're going to Watford. Pardon. So, yeah, you've no choice in it. We need the money. So, got him in Mini and drove down to Watford, 200 miles in a clapped out Mini. And the exhaust was held up by a Burnley scarf, actually, otherwise it'd have fallen off. And um, got there. And the following Saturday, I was playing for Watford in the first team against the then league champions, Everton. So it was as fast as that. And oddly enough, blowing my trumpet, I got man of the match in both the Scunthorpe game and the Everton game, which proved to me that you can make the step up if you, if you, I don't know, apply yourself. So it was interesting, yeah. And then playing for Watford was just going from, but it was the equivalent of going from work performing as a band, you know, in working men's clubs to playing in amphitheatres. You know, instead of 3,000 people where you could hear every crass comment going, you're at Old Trafford and you can't hear yourself think or or Anfield or Leeds or somewhere, you know. Leeds was the worst. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a big change, but enjoyable, obviously. The one interesting thing was that when I went to Watford, I thought, this is the real big time, especially when I scored the winner against Arsenal at Highbury. We beat them 1 0. And um, I thought this is really professional. But as I analysed it over a slow period of time of about 18 months that it lasted, it wasn't in many respects as professional as it should have been. And there were certain things at Halifax that were more professional than at Watford. I can go into it in later detail. So it it sort of melted away a little bit. So the immediate glamour was great, you know, suddenly catapulting into that environment. But when I analysed it, having done my sports science degree or human movement degree, it wasn't where it should be, certainly where it, where they are now. And then when I transferred to Oldham, that was far more professional than Watford. Yes. I don't mean in people's looking after themselves and that. It's just the general thing, the approach. Yes. What they did in training wasn't specific enough for me particularly. It's like asking a quarterback to be a linebacker or something. It's just I was doing things as a, a left winger. That was, That's what you do as a left winger. But it, I was having to do things like endless possession games. That's not what wingers do. When, when a winger gets a ball, everyone else clears off or gets in the box and leaves him to it. Not pass it back and pass it back, and pa which we can go on, on to. So that's where things fell apart for me a little bit at Watford. And that's why I blossomed at Oldham, because they were more training and game specific for my game. Come from Steve Harrison that does training methods because he, he later worked with Graham Taylor for England, didn't he? They were just driving me up the wall. So you'd have 8v8 in um, a 60 by 50 coned off area and you just pass it. 10 passes equals a goal. But it was like eclectic rubbish. It didn't mean anything. Whereas when it got to Oldham, we were playing 10v10 on a 60 by 70 pitch, full-size goals, and it was just a micro game that you would do on a Saturday. It was all going in the right direction. You were playing it forward when you can. Okay, you come back sometimes. So the, the training method was... I mean, I've got a really funny story about it later when I joined Man City because there was a uh, an echo of... Watford arrived at Man City in the guise of Sam Ellis. And he was a big Watford man. He was originally from Blackpool. And he was a great bloke. I must have you know, got on well, so well with him off the pitch. And he set up this endless stuff. Uh, when, and Peter Reid was a big fan of it as well. Just circulating the ball endlessly. And after about three training sessions, after I'd signed, 
uh, when I got the ball and this keep ball, they like to call it, I flicked it up and booted it out of the ground. And then I did it again. And then for the third time, I flicked it up and kicked it out of the ground. So Sam Ellis stopped. He said, what are you doing? I thought it's just as effective as keeping the ball, isn't it? So the opposition caught score. And he said, look, just go in. And then afterwards, we had a meeting and I explained to him what I wanted to do, which was crossing and shooting, getting the ball, playing one tooth, taking men on and doing that classic wing play. So he let me go and do that with a couple of the other lads. And sometimes as a player, you've got to say ownership. So that's what it was like. Your career is linked with Oldham Athletics run that started and ended with two FA Cup semifinals versus Manchester United in 1990 mm -hmm. and 1994. In fact, both ended yeah. in replays. During this mm -hmm. run, your side was promoted to the old first division and relegated mm -hmm. from the new Premier League. Can you yeah. talk about this experience with manager Joe Royal and teammates such as Earl Barrett, Neil Redfern, mm -hmm. Dennis Irving, Ian Marshall, Andy Ritchie, and I could go on. Yes. Well, it's quite simple for me. When when I signed for Oldham under Joe Royal, I quickly recognised what a class act he was. And we, I'd been in the old first division, as is Premier League, with Watford for 10 games. And I thought, that's where I want to be. Signed for Oldham, and they're in the second division. And the hope was we would get promotion. Now, unfortunately, we went on one of the daftest cup dual runs of all time, which was fantastic for the fans. Uh, it was good for us in one respect, which I'll go on to in a minute. But it, you know, uh, getting to the final of the League Cup, semi-final replay of the FA Cup, as you say, completely wiped out our chances of getting promotion to the top league. So the way you interject and say, and it, you coincide in between there was a, a promotion to the top flight, that was the whole game all along. So the following season after the initial dual cup run, we all said to ourselves, after we drowned ourselves in the bath, losing at Wembley, we said, forget the cups, let's just get promotion. And that's essentially what we did. So that was, I've just been writing about it in my book, Plug Plug, about getting to the promised land. Because that's all that mattered to us. We did. And when we got promotion, and I've got still got my medal, 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 that was the most important thing for us. And then we had, uh, we had a season in the old first division when we stayed up and did very well and frightened teams. And what the cup runs did, though, was give us so much confidence that we could play against these top sides. And not in just one-offs, because we beat half a dozen of them in both cups, you see. So we knew we could cut the, we could hack it. So we had a really good season in the year after promotion. And then I got transferred to the Premier League team, Man City, because after that first season, it was all first division, then it changed to Premier League. And I transferred to Man City. I had a season there. And then the following season, we came back. And the, the reverse happened of the first season at Oldham, where in trying to stay in the Premier League, we end up on another Daft Cup run, get to another semi-final, which cost us our place in the Premier League. So it's like this bell-shaped curve of success. And it only had one little bit in the middle and it strung out at the end. And that was essentially the five-year career at Oldham. It was enjoyable, don't get me wrong, but it just um, wasn't the goal in the right area at the right time, I suppose. Although some people might say they'd rather win three cups and not a promotion, but I'd, I'd rather have played in that top flight, to be honest. Do you think that during the first cup runs that that team maybe wasn't taken as seriously as it should have been because of the plastic pitch that it maybe took 
until that semi-final against Manchester United, the two games, I think for maybe a wider audience to to accept that that was a top quality team on any surface. Yeah, I think I think when you say wasn't understood as being a good side only by fans perhaps of other teams, but certainly all the opposition knew us very well and they knew that the pedigree, if we go into the lads, as you say, likes of Dennis Irwin. I mean, Joe Raid had leads a lot. Um, so Andy Ritchie and Dennis Irwin were class acts from there. Good players, really good players. Ian Marshall and Neil Adams from Everton, good players. And they're all... Well, the, the title on the book I've just written is a, a, what Joe Royal said to us at the beginning of the season that we had to get promotion. He said... He always used to say, come on, lads, two minutes of your time. I just want two minutes of your time. And this was middle of the training ground. And he'd, he'd say something like, one of you's mooned at a wagon driver on the bus to West Brom or someone's thrown a japati at someone in a restaurant on, a, on Saturday. It was, But this particular time, he said, I all want you to remember, and he's talking to a really good bunch of players, but he said, I want you to remember that you're all here at Oldham Athletic because basically there is something wrong with you. And he was right, because I'd been at Watford and not cut it, if you like. Addo and Marsh had been at Everton, not cut it. Paul Warhurst, Earl Barrett had been at City, not cut it. And the list goes on. And so we gelled and it was some sort of like ancient gloopy soup and you just go splat and it works. But he has to take the credit because he knew what what he wanted in what departments for his for his squad. So yes, I think the rest of the football league took us seriously and appreciated us. I think it stunned a lot of fans. I think it stunned our own fans to start with, but they soon uh, got to grips with it. But we all certainly knew that there was something wrong with us, but we had to put it right. Bringing another book at this point, This Is How It Feels by Mike Keegan. That talks yeah. about the rise of the team and yeah. how so many of those players had been rejected by let's say, so-called bigger clubs. The, yeah. A lot of the players you've mentioned, Erwin Barrett, Marshall Warhurst. Yeah. And that just doesn't happen in, in modern football. And I'm guessing a lot of that is due to the wage differentials that players aren't prepared to drop down which mm. I guess is the key question that I hope my book addresses as well, which is yeah. how has big money, especially what the inflation of players' wages, changed the English game? It certainly has. It's, it's changed desire for people to drop down, certainly. I mean, in our era, there was always talk of, look, I'm, I want out of here because I want first-team football. So you'd, you'd leave being in and out of the team at Everton to go and join Oldham because you were guaranteed more or less, not totally, but playing first team football because after all, that's what you did. Playing under 21s, under 23s in the modern day is not as good as playing for Wickham Wanderers or someone, in my opinion. And it still, it still remains the same. So you're unlikely to get this sudden cluster of players from top clubs suddenly joining a championship side like, let's just say, take the top six or seven clubs in the Premier League now and they all, they're all they all raided by some ambitious manager somewhere like um, Sheffield United. That ain't going to happen because of the wages. Now, I'm not saying humans are inherently greedy, but um, I'm sure money does persuade them to, to stay and not not chalk up as many league games as they should. So it has changed, in my opinion. Lots of other things have changed, of course, but that is one of the fundamental things that you bring up. And you make your point quite clearly in your book. I think it's transfer fees, wages. That you're not going to go back to, to that situation where, where players are leaving Everton or Manchester City. To, certainly not to join Oldham Athletic, but as you say, probably not even to join a mid-table championship team. Exactly, yeah. But it makes me wonder what criterion they, they have, have produced to con the manager 
that they're good enough to stay at the Premier League club and not actually play for the first team and not say, right, get out. We don't want you on 50 grand a week playing in the reserves or under 21s or under 23s. It just wouldn't have happened in our day. Well, there wasn't the money, but for some reason, maybe it's agent led, but they seem to get away with it. I'll tell you a story. When we were um, at Barnsley, I'd, I'd become assistant manager by then, as well as head physio and, and, and chef, and, and I'd swept the ground as well. And um, I'd cleared the pigeons out of the loft. And um, we needed a centre half. So Andy Ritchie gets on the phone and rings Butch Wilkins, Ray Wilkins, who was at Chelsea and said, have you got any centre-halves kicking about? And he said, oh, yeah, we've got this really good lad. He's 21. He plays in our under-21s and he marks Hernan Crespo all the time really well in training. So, oh, yeah. Anyway, I'm a bit suspicious. Andy, we get him up and have a couple of training sessions and we put him in against Chesterfield, first game, you know, this is in the League One, the third division, and the first minute of the game, he goes up, as a, he's a centre-half, up against Steve Blatherwick, a really old-fashioned centre-forward who just went, bosh, right on his door, boy. He went down like he'd been shot, and we stretched him off, and that's it, we sent him back to Chelsea. So it's all right. Marking Hernan Crespo out of the game in, in training because Hernan doesn't give a monkeys. But when it comes to A lads, A on a wet, cold Saturday afternoon at Chesterfield, can't cut the mustard. So a lot of this is a falsity. And if you were that good, you'd be in the first team at, uh, at Chelsea. But you're not. You're not good enough to be in Barnes, this first team, mate. So, yeah, I don't know why why it's happening, to be honest. It must, must be agent-led or people are getting a false impression of what academy football is and what under-21s and under-23s is. Because when I was playing, for example, at Burnley Reserves, that was real blood and thunder. It was real. That's how I made it. Because suddenly I thought, well, I've got to get up to speed here. And it really did equip you for playing first team with the reserves. So there's a proper transition. If you were doing really well in the reserves, it was a good yardstick, litmus paper job to say you're good enough for the first team now. You are from the generation of players that played in the old first division and transitioned into this new Premier League. Were there noticeable differences in the immediate change or as a player, you're just living day by day your profession and not even realizing? No, we, all, we had a meeting. I always remember Willie Donachie, who was the coach, came in and said, there's going to be changes next year, lads, and it's going to be a, a, a new format. There's going to be clubs invited to join this new Premier League, and we'll be one of them because we're a current first division team and I just laughed at him and a few of us did and said well what they're doing they're just changing the name from first to premier it's exactly the same only in French it was like a premonition of Arsene Wenger arriving and uh, so it, well, there was absolutely no difference to start with and I don't think I think it's been a slow transition and then around about 2001, two, it suddenly exploded into bigger wages. But I, I, I've been watching the big match on ITV on some six o'clock, watching 70s and 60s and 80s matches. And I'll be honest, as a, as a professional eye on it, I don't see any difference in the skill levels between then and now. In fact, some of it's worse. But what I do see is perhaps quicker stuff at times, perhaps fitter and more frenetic stuff. I see better pictures, possibly better diets and conditioning, but certainly not skill. So we, we didn't notice it at all. 
Well, I never noticed it in my career anyway. Well, apart from when I played for Man City in the first game, the first Monday night game ever I played in. And the only difference was when we ran out down the tunnel in this half dilapidated being done up main road stand, there were about two dozen dolly birds doing that American stuff with the pom-poms and all this and some music and thought, what the heck is this all about? I'm trying to concentrate on football here. <laughs> um, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but but many players thrived under Joe Royal's management. This was also said when he was at Everton as well. Yeah. And that his, his methods were, were quite innovative and different than what a lot of English players were used to at the time and obviously helped to improve those players. Can you talk about that from the perspective of your time at Oldham and maybe contrast it with some of the other managers you worked under? Yeah, well, as, as I said, I mean, Halifax was the closest to, to Joe's thing with Billy Eyre and they're both very erudite thinkers of the game. As I said, it was more specific, you know, let's do things that are relevant. So endless practices that aren't relevant just were binned. But his greatest, I mean, he had Willie Donicky doing all sorts of travelling around the world and picking up bits and bats of coaching. But it was, like I say, it was very relevant. But his biggest asset by far that any manager was his, I mean, anyone can coach, really, but a few can manage. And it's managing all these personalities. And that's what he was really good at. So he had a, I mean, I'll be honest with you, off the record, it was a dressing room full of lunatics, all in their own different way. And, you know, some of the scrapes are incredibly funny. But there was he knew that there was an undercurrent of us wanting to be as professional as we could, which we were. And he just managed the personalities very well. Whereas when I was at Watford, for example, to give you the opposite, Steve Harrison couldn't handle me for me responses to his some of his stuff and he couldn't handle Neil Redfern and he couldn't handle young Lee Richardson who who was followed me down from Halifax uh, it was almost like you know, you've got too much to say whereas Joe's favourite saying is it's all about players anyway so that was his his best asset as well. I mean I've what what I mean the other thing is he, he was he was really good at making decisions on pitch on a Saturday. So he used to say to us, look, it's what you do on a Saturday, boys. And it was what he did on a Saturday as well, not what, what training session he put on on a Tuesday afternoon. So he never let the grass grow under his feet. If he saw something not right after five minutes, he'd change it, even to the extent of taking someone off and admitting he was wrong. So his tactical stuff on a Saturday was, was brilliant as well. But, I mean, like I say, anyone can put cones down and make all the lads running about and in and out of that, but that doesn't matter. Certainly doesn't matter. You touched up earlier about reserve team football. I wonder if you could expand on that, because obviously everyone's ambition is to play in the first team. Yet yeah. the reserve team is good for players that are out of favor at the time and need game time, as well mm-hmm. as players who are coming back from injury and even younger players who need the experience. Can you talk yeah. about those the experience and the atmosphere around the reserve team match, the crowds, etc.? Yeah, I mean, quite simple. You've got probably three layers of, of it. You've got the young lads that are coming through from 16 into first team you know, ambition. And then you've got lads who are out of form, who are dropped out of the first team and into the reserves to get some form. And then you've got a, a bit in the middle, which is trialists and injuries. Yeah. So often they wouldn't just go and buy someone. They would try them, take them on loan, put them in the stiffs, as we called it. So you had three legs. So the atmosphere was, I played in the reserves at Burnley and I was just full of hell and ambition. When I was playing at Oldham and I got injured, 
I was the same um, because I wanted to get back in the first team. When I was at Watford and dropped because I fell out of favour with Steve Harrison, it was the worst place in the world I wanted to be. Get me out of here. I'm too good for this. So I signed for Oldham. So it was like three different scenarios going on. But I'll tell you what it was. It was very tough and competitive. And, and it was good. I mean, I learned a lot. I, I remember we were playing Sunderland, Burnley Reserves against Sunderland Reserves. And as I'm walking off, there's a player called David Hodgson. Now, he's the first team player for Liverpool and Sunderland, Middlesbrough. Brilliant. And he, he walked off with me at halftime. He said, well done, lad. He said, you're doing really well. I like what you're doing and all that. And there was even that camaraderie going on across the teams. So I learned a lot of playing in reserve team football. And if you're willing to learn, it's a great environment for you as a youngster. Certainly better than playing we need namby-pamby under-21 stuff. And would the first team manager monitor these matches or was it always someone, like an assistant? No, he would. No, he would. But he wouldn't always let you know you, he was there. He might be hiding in the crowd with his mark and his, his brim pulled down low, you know? So he never knew whether he was there or not. So he could see whether you were up for it or you know, just going through the motions. So, as, But he did monitor it, yeah. yeah. As did they do. I mean, take it stage further. When I signed for Oldham from Watford, Joe told me that he wanted to sign me from Halifax, but they couldn't afford it. And he was gutted that he couldn't. And he used to come and watch us because Halifax played on a Friday night a lot. So he could come with his chief scout, Jim Castle, and they come and watch us every Friday night that they could. And so they didn't rely on scouts like they do now, you know, and directors of football and all that to get me a player. They would go and do it themselves and watch. So there was even that dedication. Of course, it caused a lot of divorces, I suppose, but spending too long in a football stand instead of home with the missus, but she knew that when she married him anyway. But that's what they did. And so what happened with me was I ended up at Watford on a, on a year and a half prison sentence until he signed me. And he could only sign me when Ian Stott, the chairman, came up to him at the start of the 89-90 season and said, look, we need some money. You're going to have to sell a player. Who can you sell? He said, well, funnily enough, Tommy Wright, who he'd bought from Leeds, Leicester wanted him for 300000 he told the chairman. He said, well, you can sell him, sell him for 300000 He said, yeah, well, he said, I want 150 of that to buy Rick Holden. So the deal was, because Tommy was a left winger, so get rid of Tommy, buy me and make 150 grand. So that was, uh, that was a, again, one of his astute... Uh, well, it was for me a stupid thinking anyway. It wasn't so much for Tommy because Leicester did nothing after. <laughs> in your interview in Paul's book, the one thing that really caught my attention was how you said that player rotation is, and in quotation marks, physiology as a sort of a smokescreen. Because nowadays yeah. it's an accepted belief that players need to be rested, and we often hear the punditry class use terms like managers must manage the players' minutes and things as such. Can you expand on that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's laughable. I mean, you saw some examples of it, actually, with people like Carlos Tevez walking off and being really annoyed at Alex Ferguson for taking him off because he didn't want resting. He's Argentinian and he wants to play every minute because that's what they do. And certainly we were the same. So what, there's a myth of, there's, there's a lot of studies which I, I know, I mean, I'll tell you one in a minute, having done this MSC and they're saying that, um, well, we need to rest them because we're, we're trying to do prehab, prevent injury. Well, that's almost like saying we're not going to build that greenhouse there because uh, it's near a cricket ground and the cricket ball might come through it. What you do is you just play. And if you do get injured, you put someone else in and you fix him. 
right? So if you've got your best 11 players, you play them, right? And then, and that's how it was. I think a lot of this stuff is not only smokescreen physiology, it's also smokescreen psychology to try and keep them happy. Oh, you need a rest. The physio tells you you need a rest or the, the, the injury and prehab and the condition, or the sports condition guy tells you, oh, yeah. And they'll get an, they'll get an isokinetic machine, uh, which is it's a big resistance machine, and it'll say, oh, your hamstrings are a bit down. And we're frightened. That, I mean, I've gone out on a pitch where my hamstrings are hanging off, you know, after 40 games, and they're not going to stop me playing. Just have a good warm up, rub some Ralex in it, and get going. So a lot of it is because they've got such big squads as well that if we don't give him a game, he's going to really spit the dummy, and he's just going to hang around and not even train. So especially if he's on a three-year contract. So a lot of it is. I mean, we we could have done with a bit of squad rotation in that first season to get promotion when we ended up playing sixty-five games. Now I'll be honest with you. On about 55 games, we were feeling it. So, But we didn't have a big enough squad to do it. But in a season of just, what is it, 38 league games? Come on. Right? And some of the training we did, I mean, they wouldn't do it now. It's like SAS training. M- Monday morning, running over Saddleworth Moor. What they do today, they go into the swimming pool. So... No, I, I don't buy into it, especially with the um, MSC I've just done. And a lot of it is just, um, it's looking for uh, galaxies that don't exist, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, we, we discussed that previously, that, that yourself and several other players in that Oldham squad played over 60 games in yeah. 89, 90. Yeah, we did. Yeah, un- unthinkable now. And, yeah. and also that every player that I did interview uh, said the same thing about rotation, that they, they just wouldn't swap the games that they played in the football league. No. No, because that's, that's it's, it's um, I don't know, it's just, um, it's just not the real thing. And there are some good analogies you could use about the real thing, but I'm not going to do. But, you know, you're either going to do the real thing or you're not. And, uh, like I say, although slightly contradictory, reserve team football is good and it's tough. It's not the real thing. It's not playing in the first team on a Saturday afternoon. And if you were told that you were rested and you weren't injured, but you rested, you know, you'd be as mad as hell back in the day. In fact, I didn't used to look, and several of us didn't look at the team sheet that they put up on a Friday uh, lunchtime. I just walked out. Because we knew we were playing, because we were doing well. So and that's that's the way it is, and you want to get that core of lads highly competitive to be in the team, not saying, "Oh well, you know, I don't mind being rested this week." Well, that's no good. Do you, do you think there's maybe actually been a change in players' mentality that it isn't just the money? Obviously, the money is a big factor, but. They accept that they're going to play less games. No one's playing sixty games a season these days. Well, it's easy. It's easy to change a player's mentality, and I'll give you an example. Of how is because when I talk about certain comedy, not going as far back as Laurel and Hardy, say two Ronnies or something to youngsters, they go what? Never heard of them. They say what? So it's as fast as that, not knowing something, and they come out with stuff like. Or before my time, that. And I say, yeah, well, 1066 was before my time, but I know about it. So you, you've got to know about stuff. and But, yeah, it's almost like they're in denial of what happened. And they'll accept it. And I can well imagine that the mentality's changed because I've just given you an example there. That they, they don't know stuff from the past. They don't know what happened. And that you're quite capable of playing a full season. You don't need resting. So I can believe there's a bit of brainwashing going on. Another alternative to earning more playing time that was much more available in your playing days was the ease with which players could be loaned to different teams 
sometime for like a, just a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think about that? Was that beneficial, the loan system at the time? Yeah, it was. I, I, you, you could go and ask someone like David Beckham and what, what helped to make him was going to places like Preston. Because, it, like I say, it's back to this, this lad we got from, which I won't name, from Chelsea. You know, that is the real thing, going to Chesterfield. So going out on loan, dropping down to help a, a club out, and that's happened, and he ends up signing and gets two or three years at a club, which would be great for him, or getting someone uh, who like Beckham and sending him to Preston just really well. That's another. That's That's one step better than the reserves, if you like. So I've gone on loan somewhere. Well, that's better than playing in the reserves because it is because you're playing on, you're getting points for it on a Saturday. You know, if you represent crew, it really means everything to those 3,000 crew fans, not not 60 people in Tuesday night in the reserves. So it's like one step up. But the other, the other thing we got more game time to was the cup competitions, of course, where, although I told you right at the beginning that it, it, it sort of, put a spanner in our works, you can almost be too successful in the Cups. It was still really important to us. So, well, it's the Cup this weekend. So that was a bit more, that added to the weight of fixtures as well. So you got more game time by playing Cups as well. Yeah, mm. speak, speaking of the Cups, the mystique of the FA Cup has clearly changed and has been downgraded with each passing year. Mm -hmm. At the time, the best teams would compete for the title while lower division teams would give it all in the competition. Yeah. Nowadays, an Oldham-like adventure is rarer and the top teams view these cups as a distraction and nuisance. Can you talk mm -hmm. about the players' views back then and your thoughts on its current demise? Yeah, there's... there's I mean, back then, it was... Um, it was so hallowed to play, say, at Wembley. Very few people did it in their careers. So oh, you played at Wembley, did you? I, I, you know, I say that. I said I played at Wembley twice. It means nothing to some lads now because they play there in playoff finals, semi-finals and playoff finals and stuff like that. But the Cup was the original big competition in, in England. You know, winning the FA Cup was... Um, the ultimate thing. I mean, I remember as a child, about uh, 72, when my team, Leeds United, won the FA Cup. Best day of my life as a kid. It, it was just fantastic, the pomp and all the glory with it. I think it's faded out through the money. That's another thing that money's done to it. It's more important to stay in the Premier League for clubs now than it is to win the FA Cup and get relegated. And so there's that priority. And also, without being cruel to them, foreign countries do not, never did value their cup competitions quite the same as the Spanish Cup or Copa del Rey, as they call it. One didn't carry the same weight in the 70s and 80s as the FA Cup did. It, it's got better since. I know that. And then, of course, the other thing is Champions League has affected the domestic cups as well. So you've got your top clubs, the top four in each country and whoever else can qualify, putting more onus on the importance of the Champions League and staying in the Premier League than winning the FA Cup and the Little, Little Woods Cup. So it has changed fundamentally. Mind you, see, you take teams like Leeds United, they were, in the 70s they were playing in the League Cup the FA Cup, the old First Division, the Fairs Cup and the European Cup, stuff like that. They, they had five cups to go at and they used to clap out as well doing that. But they were straight knockouts. You know, the European Cup, when Forest won it, for example, and Liverpool, it was just like a, an FA Cup for European clubs. But now this Champions League's generated so much money, that's just overtaken the, uh, the onus of the domestic cups probably in all countries. And it's also television that's affected the status of the FA Cup because there were so few televised games. And the, the Cup final was obviously the 
the big one for, for English yeah. football. You'd have all just day like coverage. Yeah, yeah. And, like and now it's... Yeah. And now it's just one of however many hundred live games there are a season. Yeah. It, 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 you're right. I mean, it gets so monotonous now. I mean, I, people say to me, are you watching the game tonight? And I say, no, no, I've got to straighten the bristles on my doormat, actually, tonight. Followed by plaiting some soot. So it was different in our day because uh, it was exciting when, you know, as a game on. But, yeah, yeah, I think that's, I won't say devalued it. It's just made it not a special event. If Christmas dinner's every day, it's not Christmas dinner, is it? So... And again, I can, I can see where everyone's coming from, and, but I'd only swap the money. I would never swap the, the, the way it was done. So pay me what they do now, back then, but I'd still want to play 64 games out of 65. So I'll be frank, I'll be frank with you, you know, we were on buttons com- compared to this lot. Another of these changes that's that's often discussed in relation to modern football and uh, can be traced to Arsene Wenger and the the first wave of foreign managers coming to England, changing the players' diet, changing the training regimes and ending, to some extent anyway, the drinking cultures. Can you talk about the training and off-field activities as a professional in your day? Yes, yeah, certainly. In our day, it was, um, drink was um, used as a reward or an antidepressant. And it had a lot of effect on people. So if you lost, never mind, lads, let's have a drink. And if you won, let's get the champagne out. The foreign brigade came in and it just didn't get the culture of having a pint after the game even, because in their countries they didn't drink pints anyway, they didn't have a glass of wine, even with the lunch before a game. But they could do it sensibly. They could, they could just stick to one glass. I mean, half of the lads that I grew up with, one glass and it ends up three bottles. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so you just wouldn't risk it. I mean, that's that funny story about Paul Gascoigne. Did I tell you that one? Yeah? Go on. We like Gaza stories. Well, when he signed, <laughs> I, I, I bumped into Gaza a few times and Vinnie Jones. I used to go out drinking with Vinnie Jones down in Hertfordshire, actually, because he was playing for Wimbledon when I was playing for Watford and we lived next door to each other practically. Anyway, when Gaza signed for Lazio, they're in pre season. And after the first game against whoever that, Heck, it was. All the lads are in the bar with the wives, and it's there is a bar there, but they're, they're sitting down and they're having a glass of water or an orange juice and stuff. In comes Gaza, goes up to the bar, gets a pint, and just whacked it back, and then ordered another, and then did it again. And all the rest of the players are like <laughs> picking the jaws up off the deck. You know, who's this? genius player we've bought that's drinking like a fish and then it was suggested by the manager he took him on one side after a few of these pre-season games and said look guys I said uh, no I'm a bit concerned that you're drinking that alcohol uh, particularly at the rate you're drinking it he said why don't you try wine so next game in he comes after the game gets a pint of wine doesn't he and knocks that back. <laughs> <laughs> and the manager went up to him and said, look, Paul, I think you better just stick to the beer. <laughs> By the way, that would have been Dino Zoff, his manager. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. yeah. The legendary yeah. goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, going back to the, the argument, I mean, we did know what to eat. Well, I certainly did, because my pre-match meal, you know, when I did this human movement degree, we did a massive module on diet, and what, we, we knew what all the top pros were at all sports, right across the board, whether it was athletics, rugby, whatever, American football. We knew what to do, and I, I knew what to do 
1984 when I started my course. You don't eat steak and chips before three hours before a game. I mean, you won't digest it till you've got home. And what I did, I mean, I, at Oldham, I used to have a baked potato and a, a, a fish, a Dover sole for my pre-match. And I used to explain to the lads, put a bit of butter on the potato, do the fork test where you get a fork and you just crush it down. And that shows you how easy it is to digest. And it's, it's good for you. I try doing that with a piece of chicken. And it, it's harder to do it. And then certainly people like Arsene Wenger, it alarmed him that the food wasn't being monitored at the club. So, for example, if you had a double training session at Oldham and I was there, uh, right, Lance, get yourself some lunch and you're back in this afternoon. So everybody would go chip shop, butty shop, anything, Yeah. Wenger and people like that came in and said, look, I want them to eat properly. So they'll produce a canteen at the training ground, employ some women, a chef, to cook up some decent grub. And so, for example, when I got to Barnsley, Paul Hart, who was a manager, showing me around this wonderful canteen and restaurant area they had for the players um, so to, to make sure they ate properly. The only problem was when I was physio, I said, have you actually monitored what they're eating? And he sort of looked at me, I said, no. So I went and spied on them for um, a few days. And with all this fantastic food on like salads and vegetables and fruit, they're ignoring that and asking the staff to just give them fish and chips and stuff on the quiet. So I had to say, look, I had to stand over them and say, why aren't you eating this good food? And one lad I'd call Danny Nardiello said, we don't like it. And I said, well, like's got nothing to do with it. Clint Eastwood, like's got nothing to do with it. You just eat it because it's, it's fuel, mate. So people like Wenger helped change that culture. I don't think he got his head around the beer culture. He just let them drift out and brought the new lot in. And again, the, the foreign player does not have... If you're father and son in Italy, you don't go out on a Friday night and sink 10 pints anyway. Well, there's just not that culture running through the, the, the veins of, of the foreign players. Not like in Britain. If you don't have a if you don't have a half a dozen pints after work on a Friday, there's something wrong with you. It's all royal, isn't it? There's something wrong with you. <laughs> Picking up what we talked about, about the loan system. Yeah. Also, the, the actual transfer system itself was much different those days. I believe a player could be transferred until maybe April, like a month or so before the end of the season. Whereas yeah. nowadays, there are these designated transfer windows. So yeah. which system do you think is better? I think it's better now because... Some players were restricted. They wanted to go out on loan to get fit, say, drop down um, to a lower division team and, and get fit, which is better than reserves, and they can't because there's a chop-off point. And there was also the windows were put in to stop people suddenly buying all the best players up for the last couple of months but as the season galloped on. You had to all, have all your players done. I mean, it, it's, it's very difficult to get that that thing right. I mean, if you take, like I say, I keep mentioning it, American football is one of my favourite um, sports. I, I, I love it watching it and I've seen a few live games and they have a special way of categorising everything. Um, we've not quite got it right, but with the top clubs, I don't think it really matters. They've got that many good players swanning around. And certainly in the lower division clubs, I wouldn't restrict Anyone buying anyone? I'd have I've had an open window all year long, mate. And if um, players want to go, let them. And uh, clubs want to take them on loan, or so I think it was a bit restrictive in our days, to be honest. And I prefer the system now. I don't think it creates uh, an unfair playing field at all. In between your years at Oldham Athletic. 
you spent a year at Manchester City, mm. the 92-93 season, and I believe part of the 93-94 season. Yeah. Despite not being what they are today, they were nevertheless a big club. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that experience? Yeah, it was very similar going from Halifax to Watford. Very similar thing going from Oldham to City. It was a big step up in terms of expectation and, and, and crowd size and things and and. Just things like going on pre-season, Oldham, we might go to Exeter and Torquay, maybe Scandinavia. Man City were off to Japan and America and places like that. So it's more of a global product. So, yeah, it was a big club. It was just, I mean, we finished something like fifth or seventh or something, I can't remember. And um, so, yeah, it, it was a great experience. I mean, I did, I did say I learned a lot, but it was, it was similar to Watford in that, again, it wasn't quite as professional as Oldham was in a lot of respects. It had this big insignia of a huge club, but it wasn't running as efficiently as Oldham was. And um, it certainly isn't the club that it is now. But it was great. I mean, I, I loved it. The, I've got, I could spend three hours talking about the daft stories that happened at City as well. You know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't different to any other football club in terms of off the field activities, that's for sure. People like Niall Quinn was as mad as that goat you're seeing out your window. <laughs> what goat? Mm. We're talking about two clubs really in, Oldham and Manchester City that couldn't be further apart today, 30 no. years on. Yeah. And obviously we all we all know what's happened to Manchester City. But mm. could you say a word or two about Oldham's current situation? Do you keep an eye on the club? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've said it for years that um, Manchester City has gradually been better managed and, and better managed and better managed right from, from the management up through the directors, everything, it's been just better and better done. Whereas Oldham's got worse. And they've not learned the model of stability. So, for example, the best two clubs in the pre-Premier era were, were Liverpool and then just going into the Premier era were Man United. And they had managers that lasted a long time. So you you developed a stability through the club. Whereas Oldham, they've had about as many managers as they've had years in the doldrums. So you can't even build a structure through your club. And it's been proved. I mean, Oldham of, of the past, from, say, 67 to 95, they only had two managers, Jimmy Frizzell and Joe Royal. But since then, they've had one manager a year practically and that's just no good for it for any business if the MD changes all the time don't know whether you're coming or going there's nothing wrong with the club itself that's just an inanimate thing that fans love but the way it's run is is reflected in the position they're in now which is tragic if they don't watch it they'll be in the uh, conference which is difficult to to imagine, to be honest. And again, do you think there's a case of, of unregulated ownership playing a part? This um, fit and proper person test doesn't seem to be working for a lot of football league clubs. You get a bad owner. Um, yeah, well, whatever they're doing, they're, they're getting rid of managers, they're getting rid of staff, they're running the yeah. club down. And yeah. a lot of clubs have, have suffered from that. And obviously, Berry and Macclesfield have gone out of business for the sake of what would be a premiership player's weekly wage, more or less, and mm. and possibly heading, unfortunately, in the same direction. Well, one of the one of the problems was the structure of the, um, the old football league and now the Premier League, which was clubs weren't allowed to have feeder clubs in their own country. So you've got, for example, Man United having a club in China, one in Australia, one in Uruguay and somewhere. 
uh, really what they wanted was to have Bury or someone as one of their little clubs. So they got isolated. And um, the, the, the fit and proper persons thing for directors and stuff, I mean, who's going to monitor that anyway? And um, the problem is that someone comes along and says, look, I'll buy you out of trouble here. Um, I'll put this amount of money in and you're struggling. You're going to say yes. And like I said, it's very difficult to, uh, it certainly isn't being monitored on human rights anyway, is it? Certainly not. <laughs> so I don't know. It's, um, I think, I think that's, there's a few factors involved in, in the, the, the gulf that's appeared between certainly League One and Two and Championship and the Championship and then the Premier League. I mean, we've always known that League One and Two, Third and Fourth Division were very similar. There's just a load of teams that should have really been divisions North and South in the country and then a feeder league to the Premier League. But the gulf is so far now. I mean, when, when we're in the Little Woods Cup, we played Scarborough second after Leeds, and they'd actually beaten Chelsea. So a fourth division side beating a first division side. Now, and that was with both first teams. Now, I, I put anything I'd got, if I had any money, on that never happening again. If you had a league two side against a full premiership side be impossible because of the gulf in player standards unless they played it on a bog in Hartlepool then that might be different but yeah there's, there's a few factors but certainly I wouldn't know how to monitor the fit and proper persons thing for who's allowed I mean you're in a democracy anyway so we're told. So as long as he's not got his money from robbing a bank, who's to stop him putting his money <laughs> into whichever club I might choose, Blythe Spartans or something? This is a problem. <laughs> it is. And one of the problems with the Premier League was when it started, it, it was just a transition, as I say, without the big money. But then you got a lot of people for example, and my sister mentioned this to me a few months ago, a lot of people with a lot of money but of no recognition. So, for example, if you take Mr Abramovich, who would have heard of him unless he was owner of Chelsea, despite his millions? Couldn't go around with a load of fans following him around streets going, oil field owner, <laughs> oil field owner. <laughs> Not interested. But when he's suddenly Chelsea, he's got this massive ego and he's satisfying it with a club. So this is what's happening. These um, people from the Ruab Dib that have just taken over a certain northeast club, uh, how much ego do you think is in that? It's certainly not for tax reasons. Don't need it. He might declare as a football fan, but why didn't he take over uh, Riyad United then? So... You know, a lot of it's egos. In fact, I'm pretty sure it is. Ian Stott certainly wasn't in it for his ego. The old owl bird. We as football fans of the yesteryears always look back at this older era of football with rose-colored glasses. How do former mm -hmm. players such as yourself view this new versus older football question? Well, you see, you've got to look at it from, I mean, you take the emotion out of it. The product hasn't changed much in human endeavour. So if you take, for example, the 800 metres. Now, there's people struggling today, despite all the training and diets, to get anywhere near Sebastian Coe's records or Steve Ovitz's records of the 80s. Eventually, human performance is going to plateau, right? So the, the physical stuff will plateau. What, where you get the difference is, where you, uh, I tend to get my rose-tinted glasses from, is I'm not saying we were any 
fitter or less fit. I'm not saying that this lot aren't as passionate as us or more passionate, but what I don't quite see that I've got my rose tinted glasses from as an older player are certain styles on the pitch, certain things that players do that make my hair stand up on end. And the rest of it, I just think, well, that's just, I'm not, I'm not, it's like, watching county cricket where all they're doing is knocking it back all the time. So a player that excites me is someone like Grealish because he gets the ball and he runs at people. Now, people like Lionel Messi gets the ball and he runs at people. And that style of play is very rare now. You're not telling me that if Diego Maradona was suddenly arrived on the scene now at 18, he wouldn't cut them to bits. He would absolutely cut this lot to shreds. Uh, what we've got a lot now, developed my rose-tinted glasses, is particularly as a winger, they get the ball, you see, and here we've got this um, back four, and they get the ball, they knock it across the back four a couple of times, and they work it round and out to the midfield and then out to the winger, and he gets it, and I'm saying, go on, take him on, and, he, and then he comes back to the centre half and then it ends up back at the keeper again I'm thinking oh <laughs> my god I'll go and put the kettle on and make myself a sandwich and they're still knocking it about so it frustrates me so that's where I develop my rose tinted thing and a lot of old players will be the same it's like rugby union's the same I, mean, I don't know if you're, how familiar you are with it uh, Shahan but rugby union has turned into almost gridiron where they don't throw the ball forward it's just bang 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 and I played a lot of rugby union which toughened me up as a kid and you love to see the ball flung out like the French do and it goes right down the line and they play these beautiful passes and they run in and score tries now it's just changed to the possession bang possession and I can't watch it to be honest with you so that's where I would answer that question. That's where I get my rose tinted glasses from, his style of play. I can tell you that um, as fans, myself and Paul, one of the things that really rankles us is as far as fans were today, they seem to be more what you English would call as plastic fans, as bandwagon fans. Whereas back in the day, it seemed like the fans were much more passionate about their team and they had a genuine affection for their team. And I, I don't know if this is something you have noticed as well. Not been to that many games in the last 10 years to comment on the, the live performance. But one thing I have noticed is that it, you know, going back to the Roy Keane accusation of his Man United fans as prone sandwich brigade, you know, they turn up and putting these these boxes around the ground and, and getting corporates in for a, a, a day at football. It's like, I'm going to Ascot this afternoon. Oh, yeah, you're going to Man United this afternoon. And that's probably where, the, the, rather than 80,000 at Burns and Park at Bolton watching Blackburn on a Wednesday, af Wednesday afternoon, and when someone scores, they'll go mad and throw the flat hats up in the air. I often wondered, actually, when the flat hats came down, they all wouldn't land in the same place, would they? So how many people went home with someone else's flat hat? But if you watch, say, the Copper America or the, the South American games that I like watching, the fans there are so noisy and passionate, it's unbelievable. And I think it's almost a culture thing. As our culture changed, certainly if you go to Chile, and, and they play a neighbour like Bolivia or Argentina. I mean, it's just, you can't hear yourself think. And I've been to watch Boca Juniors in La Bombonara, and they were playing someone like Newell's, and the, the noise was unbelievable. And that's, it's always been like that. But maybe it's got something to do with money again, you know, maybe top-class Premier games are attracting all these people with money that don't want to jump up and down, whereas down in Chile, I'm not accusing them of all being working class in Chile, but maybe they're just a more working man's game still down there. I don't know. But uh, certainly Leeds United is still noisy. I know that. I've, had, I've got some mates who go there and it's still very, very 
passion at that place. Perhaps it's a very individual city thing. I think the old seat has changed it, definitely. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Terraces yeah. that maybe it's gone, it's gone a little bit too far in that direction of being a little bit sanitised. Well, they didn't, they didn't have any choice, did they? Because, I mean, when I first went to Ellen Road as about 13, 14-year-old boy, I was actually frightened to death because it was a culture of yobboism, a lot of it. And it got out of hand with, you know, it's the first time I'd ever seen police horses and stuff charging around. You can imagine what it was like at Agincourt or something. But it had to change that because of the disasters and stuff. But as you say, I think it's swung too far now. And the pen, pendulum tends to do that, though, doesn't it? In anything you you say, and, and once you get the momentum of change, it clatters up the other side and you end up, you know, in the juxtaposed position that you want. You want it to come down to some sort of equilibrium. So this, this new proposal of having certain areas where you stand, and that's what they should do. They should have a stadium where, You've got your prawn sandwich bit in one little arc, and then your seat a bit in another, then your standing bit there, and then your punch up area where both sets of fans can go in and have a good punch up if they want. And then the coppers can come in with dogs and batons and let a few tigers loose. So you could have, uh, you know, you could have half time in entertainment, couldn't you? Never mind this singing stuff. Have a big punch up between uh, Chile and Bolivia. Right, we've just got uh, 10 representatives here of Chile and 10 from Bolivia, and it's uh, three rounds. Off you go. But, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to get the balance, I suppose. But, I mean, as a player, you just want to please the fans by doing good stuff on the pitch, and it's great if you can get the fans to give you, you know, get them going. Uh, that's all we thought, anyway. I think a lot of it comes back to that. I said at the, the start, you had an individual style of play. A lot of those players maybe wouldn't fit into modern football, which seems to be very much every phase of play is rehearsed and practised. It doesn't seem as spontaneous. You don't seem to have players that, that maybe play their own style a little bit. Even someone like Roger Palmer, you wouldn't really know even what position he'd describe him as playing. He certainly wasn't working back in his own half and he'd just appear and knock in 15, yeah. 20 goals a season. Ian Marshall's yeah. another unorthodox player. You saw yeah, I mean, that seemed to be encouraged and definitely the fans identified with that. Yeah. Players with character and their own style. I mean, what you had at all of them was people like Marshy and Roger, they were very quick and you wanted to encourage them to go forward, not working back. Myself, I was middle of the road pace and I like working back. I like to get the ball deep, though. You see, this is what I try and coach when I'm coaching wing play. But, yeah, the, the, the you, you would have great difficulty plucking, say, a hybrid side out of the 70s and trying to coach them today. Like I said, I couldn't tolerate it back then anyway, when it was creeping in. I'll tell you one of the, the other things, what happens now, for example, they do this, um, I don't know if you've been to a game recently where it started, Willie Donicky brought it in and well, I just refused to do it, but they have a five-a-side game before the game actually starts. So they bib up the team, 5v5, and they, they play a little possession game for five minutes and I think him I said to Willie and jo, well, I said to Joe I said I'm not doing that I said I'm expending too much energy doing that and I said if you don't think I'm going to work hard enough then take me off and you know when you watch uh, match of the day and they, they start saying oh and they analyse it you know they've got Micah Richards there saying oh look at him he's not running back I'm saying to myself I wonder if that's because he lost a load of energy doing that five-a-side game before they started. And um, so, I mean, our warm-ups were, we, we concentrated on doing our own individual thing. I mean, I would go and take corners from all the different parts of the ground 
the four corners to see what the wind was doing. And, and, and the opposition, they weren't giving monkeys what if I did that. You know, I was just practicing my, it's like a golfer just going out and seeing how far he needs to hit the ball and stuff. Now, I, I, I think, not calling them robots, but they just have this homogenized routine and it's almost homogeneity watching it as, as well. And then when someone does something outstanding, it's like, wow. That used to happen every five minutes at uh, in back in the day. I think it definitely can seem more robotic and less less free flowing. Maybe even the pitches play a part on that. You played on all different surfaces and now every top class game's played on a perfect surface. Maybe yeah, just like taking a bit of variety out of it. Yeah. Yeah, although I say, I mean, if I was picking the England side, I would pick Grealish and 10 others. The individual flair and mentality, maybe, maybe uh, life's changed. I mean, is it a product of everybody being on the laptops or their iPhones? You just don't know what it is. Instead of playing knock and run in the street and being slightly mischievous, are people just not the same type of adventurous type people anymore? I don't know. Probably conditioned, conditioned behaviour in training, and they think that that will, if we do it repetitively enough in training, then we do that on a Saturday, it'll be great, and we'll win. And you get these managers the, like the other day, who's who's the lad at uh, Villa, the manager there, and he says uh, he, he can't understand it. He said we had. Must have had 80% of possession and we've lost 3-2. Well, wake up call, mate. You conceded three goals and good ones, yeah? And you've had all this possession and you can't understand it. Well, that's football, eh? So, <laughs> get real. With that, we would like to thank you for the memories. Of oh, that's good. Pleasure. Gone by. So... Once again, we would like to thank you for your participation in this interview. As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. You may contact yeah. contact me on my blog, on Twitter at SP1873, and on Facebook, I'm under Soccer Nostalgia. As thank you, you can say, everybody in the world, please buy Rick Holden and Dave Moore's book, The Crusade, about Oldham Athletic, done by Wibble Publishing, and it's out for Christmas. Thank you very, very good. much. Yes. And I've, in fact, I've uh, included your link to your autobiography as well for everyone. Oh, right. Well, I'm going to write another one about uh, the change in the last 10 years, but thanks very much anyway, guys. And thank, I'm, I'm glad we got the technology sorted. We've learned something. <laughs> <haven't> we? <laughs> yeah. You may also contact Mr. Paul Whittle at 1888letter on Twitter and the 1888 letter is black. You may follow the podcast on Spotify under Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. And as really? well as the links to Mr. Holden's books, I've also included the link to Paul's book as well at Wibble Publishing. And the name of that book is Before the Premier League, A History of the Football League's Brilliant. Last Decades. And yeah, that includes really. the interview with Mr. Holden as well. Thank you once again. Pleasure. Yeah. Well, take care, guys. And um, you know, we know how to work the phone. You know where I am if you want to chat. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Rick. You. Okay. Cheers, boys. Oh, Thank you. Time for proper tea. Bye. See you later. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye bye.